Section 59 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. All About Coffee by William Eukers. Coffee in Relation to the Fine Arts. Part 1. How coffee and coffee drinking have been celebrated in painting, engraving, sculpture, caricature, lithography, and music. Epics, rhapsodies, and cantatas in praise of coffee. Beautiful specimens of the art of the potter and the silversmith as shown in the coffee service of various periods in the world's history. Some historical relics. Coffee has inspired the imagination of many poets, musicians, and painters. In seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, those whose genius was dedicated to the fine arts seem to have fallen under its spell and to have produced much of great beauty that has endured. To the painters, engravers, and caricaturists of that period, we are particularly indebted for pictures that have added greatly to our knowledge of early coffee customs and manners. Adrian van Ostad, sixteen ten to sixteen eighty five, the Dutch genre painter and etcher, pupil of Franz Hals in his Dutch coffee house, sixteen fifty, shows the genesis of the coffee house of Western Europe, about the time it still partook of some of the tavern characteristics. Coffee is being served to a group in the foreground. It is believed to be the oldest existing picture of a coffee house. The illustration is after the etching by J. Beauvarlet in the graphic collection at Munich. William Hogarth, 1697-1764, the famous English painter and engraver of satirical subjects, chose the coffee houses of his time for the scenes of a number of his social caricatures. In his series, Four Times of the Day, which throws a vivid light on the street life of London of the period of 1738, we are shown Covent Garden at 7.55 a.m. by the clock on St. Paul's Church. A prim maiden lady, said to have been sketched from an elderly relation of the artist who cut him out of her will, on her way home from early service, accompanied by a shivering footboy, is scandalized by the spectacle presented by some roistering blades issuing from Tom King's notorious coffee house to the right. The beaux are forcing their attentions upon the more comely of the market women in the foreground. Tom King was a scholar at Eton before he began his ignoble career. At the date of this picture, it is thought he had been succeeded by his widow, Moll King, also of scandalous repute. Scene 6 of The Rake's Progress by Hogarth is laid at the club in White's Chocolate Coffee House, which Dr. Swift described as the common rendezvous of infamous sharpers and noble cullies. The rake has lost all his recently acquired wealth, pulls off his wig, and flings himself upon the floor in a paroxysm of fury and execration. In allusion to the burning of whites in 1733, flames are seen bursting from the wainscot, but the preoccupied gamblers take no heed, even of the watchman crying fire. To the left is seated a highwayman, with horse pistol and black mask in a skirt pocket of his coat. He is so engrossed in his thoughts that he does not notice the boy at his side offering a glass of liquor on a tray. The scene well depicts the low estate to which Whites had fallen. It recalls a bit of dialogue from Farquhar's Beau Stratagem, Act 3, Scene 2, where Aimwell says to Gibet, who is a highwayman, Pray, sir, hand I seen your face at Will's coffee house? Yes, sir, and at White's, too, answers the highwayman. After the fire, the club and chocolate house were removed to Gaunt's coffee house. The removal was thus announced in the Daily Post of May 3rd. This is to acquaint all noblemen and gentlemen that Mr. Arthur, having had the misfortune to be burnt out of White's chocolate house, is removed to Gaunt's coffee house, next the St. James coffee house in St. James Street where he humbly begs they will favor him with their company as usual. Alessandro Longhi, 1733 to 1813, the Italian painter and engraver called the Venetian Hogarth, in one of his pictures presenting life and manners in Venice during the years of her decadence, shows Goldoni, the dramatist, as a visitor in a cafe of the period, 
with a female mendicant soliciting alms in the louvre at paris hangs the petit dejeuner by francois boucher seventeen o three to seventeen seventy famous court painter of louis the fifteenth it shows a french breakfast room of the period of seventeen forty four and is interesting because it illustrates the introduction of coffee into the home it shows also the coffee service of the time in van loo's portrait of madame de pompadour second mistress and political adviser of louis the fifteenth of france the coffee service of a later period of the eighteenth century appears the nubian servant is shown offering the marquise a demitasse which has just been poured from the covered oriental pot which succeeded the original arabian turkish boiler and was much in vogue at the time coffee and madame du berry or would it be more polite to say madame du berry and coffee inspired the celebrated painting of madame de pompadour's successor in the affections of louis the well-beloved this is entitled madame du berry at versailles and in the versailles catalogue it is described as painted by de Cruz after Drouet. De Cruz was a pupil of Gros and painted many of the historical portraits at Versailles. Malcolm C. Salomon, in his French color prints of the 18th century, referring to Dagoti's print of this picture done in 1771, says, The original has been attributed to Francois Hubert Drouet but there can be little doubt that the original portraiture was from the hand of the engraver, Dagoti, as the style is far inferior to Drouet. He thus describes it. Here we see the last of Louis XV's mistresses sitting in her bedroom in that alluring retreat of hers at Louvre Sienne, near the woods of Marley, as she takes her cup of coffee from her pet attendant, the little negro boy Zamour, as the Prince de Conti had named him, all brave in red and gold doubtless she is expecting the morning visit of the king no longer the handsome young gallant but old and leaden-eyed and puffy-cheeked and perhaps it will be on this very morning that she will wheedle louis in a moment of extravagant badinage into appointing the negro boy to be governor of the chateau and pavilion of louvre at a handsome salary just as on another day she playfully teased the jaded old sensualist into decorating with the cordon bleu her cuisiniere when it was triumphantly revealed to him that the dinner he had been praising with enthusiastic gusto was after all the work of a woman cook the very possibility of which he had contemptuously doubted but as we look at these two the royal mistress and her little black favorite we forget the well-beloved and his voluptuous pleasures and indulgences for in the shadows we see another picture some twenty years on when the proud unconscionable beauty no longer reine de la main gauche stands before the dreaded tribunal of the terror while zamore the treacherous ungrateful negro dismissed from his service at louvre sienne and now devoted to the committee of public safety and one of her implacable accusers sends her shrieking to the guillotine the introduction of the coffee-house into europe was memorialized by franz Schams, the genre painter pupil of the vienna academy in a beautiful picture entitled the first coffee-house in vienna sixteen eighty four owned by the austrian art society a lithographic reproduction was executed by the artist and printed by joseph stoofs in vienna there are several specimens in the united states and the illustration printed on page forty eight has been made from one of these in the possession of the author the picture shows the interior of the blue bottle where kolschitsky opened the first coffee house in vienna the hero proprietor stands in the foreground pouring a cup of the beverage from an oriental coffee pot and another is suspended from the coffee house sign that hangs over the fireplace in the fire alcove a woman is pounding coffee in a mortar men and women in the costumes of the period are being served coffee by a vienna madchen the painters mariolat de camp and de tournemine have pictured cafe scenes the first in his cafe sur une route de syrie which was shown at the salon of eighteen forty four the second of his cafe turk 
which figured at the exposition of eighteen fifty five and the third in his cafe on asia mineur which received honors at the salon of eighteen fifty nine and attracted attention at the universal exposition of eighteen sixty seven a decorative panel designed for the buffet at the paris opera house by s mazerolle was shown at the exposition of eighteen seventy eight a french artist jaconde has painted two charming compositions one representing the reading room and the other the interior of a cafe many german artists have shown coffee manners and customs in pictures that are now hanging in well-known european galleries among others mention should be made of c schmidt's the sweets shop of josti in berlin eighteen forty five mild's pastor rautenberg and his family at the coffee table eighteen thirty three and his manager Klassen and his family at the afternoon coffee table eighteen forty adolf menzel's parisian boulevard cafe eighteen seventy hugo meith's saturday afternoon at the coffee table john phillips old woman with coffee cup friedrich wall's afternoon coffee in the court gardens at munich paul meyerheim's oriental coffee house and peter philippi's dusseldorf coffee be such at the exposition des beaux-arts salon of eighteen eighty one there was shown p a ruffio's picture le cafe vient au secours de la muse coffee comes to the aid of the muse in which the graceful form of an oriental ewer appears the coffee house at cairo a canvas by jean leon jerome eighteen twenty four to nineteen o four that hangs in the metropolitan museum of art new york has been much admired it shows the interior of a typical oriental coffee house with two men near a furnace at the left preparing the beverage a man seated on a wicker basket about to smoke a hookah a dervish dancing and several persons seated against the wall in the background the new york historical society acquired in nineteen o seven from miss margaret a ingram an oil painting of the tontine coffee house it was painted in philadelphia by francis guy and was sold at a raffle after having been admired by president john adams it shows lower wall street in seventeen ninety six to eighteen hundred with the tontine coffee house on the northwest corner of wall and water streets where its more famous predecessor the merchant's coffee house was located before it moved to quarters diagonally opposite charles p groups born eighteen sixty painting showing general washington's official welcome to new york by city and state officials at the merchant's coffee house april twenty third seventeen eighty nine just one week before his inauguration as first president of the united states is a colorful canvas that has been much praised for its atmosphere and historical associations it is the property of the author the art museums and libraries of every country contain many beautiful watercolors engravings prints drawings and lithographs whose creators found inspiration in coffee space permits the mention of only a few t h shepherd has preserved for us buttons afterward the caledonian coffee house great russell street covent garden in a watercolor drawing of eighteen fifty seven tom's coffee house seventeen great russell street covent garden eighteen fifty seven slaughter's coffee house in st martin's lane eighteen forty one also in eighteen fifty seven the lion's head at buttons put up by addison and now the property of the duke of bedford at woburn hogarth figures in the sam ireland collection with several original drawings of frequenters of buttons in seventeen thirty thomas rolanson seventeen fifty six to eighteen twenty seven the great english caricaturist and illustrator has given us several fine pictures of english coffee-house life his mad dog in a coffee-house presents a lively scene and his water-color of the french coffee-house is one of the best pictures we have of the french coffee-house in london 
as it looked during the latter half of the eighteenth century during the campaign in france in eighteen fourteen napoleon arrived one day unheralded in a country presbytery where the good cure was quietly turning his hand coffee roaster the emperor asked him what are you doing there abbe sire replied the priest i am doing like you i am burning the colonial fodder charlet seventeen ninety two to eighteen forty five made a lithograph of the incident several french poet musicians resorted to music to celebrate coffee Brittany has its own songs in praise of coffee as have other french provinces there are many epics rhapsodies and cantatas and even a comic opera by mayotte music by deaf bearing the title le café du roi produced at the théâtre lyrique november sixteenth eighteen sixty one fusilier wrote in honor of coffee a cantata set to music by bernier this is the burden of the poet's song ah coffee what climes yet unknown ignore the clear fires that thy vapors inspire thou countest in thy vast empire those realms that bacchus's reign disown favored liquid which fills all my soul with delights thy enchantments to life happy hours persuade we vanquish even sleep by thy fortunate aid thou hast rescued the hours sleep would rob from our nights favored liquid which fills all my soul with delights thy enchantments to life happy hours persuade o liquid that i love triumphant stream of sable even for the gods above drive nectar from the table make thou relentless war on treacherous juices sly let earth taste and adore the sweet calm of the sky o liquid that i love triumphant stream of sable even for the gods above drive nectar from the table during the early vogue of the cafe in paris a chanson entitled coffee reproduced here was set to music with accompaniment for the piano by m h collet a professor of harmony at the conservatoire printed in the form of a placard and put up in cafes it received the approbation of and was signed by de voyeur d'argenson at that time seventeen eleven lieutenant of police this poetry is not irreproachable it can hardly be attributed to any of the well-known poets of the time but rather to one of those bohemian rhymesters that wrote all too abundantly on all sorts of subjects it is the development of a theory concerning the properties of coffee and the best method of making it it is interesting to note that the uses of advertising were known and appreciated in paris in seventeen eleven for in the chanson there appears the name and address of one vilain a merchant rue des lombards who was evidently in fashion at that point the translation of the stanza reproduced as follows coffee a chanson if you with mind untroubled would flourish day by day let each day of the seven find coffee on your tray it will your frame preserve from every malady its virtues drive afar la la migraine and dread catarrh ha ha dull cold and lethargy the most notable contribution to the music of coffee if one may be permitted the expression is the coffee cantata of johann sebastian bach sixteen eighty five to seventeen fifty the german organist and the most modern composer of the first half of the eighteenth century he hymned the religious sentiment of protestant germany and in his coffee cantata he tells in music the protest of the fair sex against the libels of the enemies of the beverage who at the time were actively urging in germany that it should be forbidden women because its use made for sterility later on the government surrounded the manufacture sale and use of coffee with many obnoxious restrictions as told in chapter eight box coffee cantata is number two hundred eleven of the secular cantatas and was published in leipzig in seventeen thirty two in german it is known as schweit still plottery nicht be silent do not talk it is written for soprano tenor 
and bass solos and orchestra. Bach used as his text a poem by Picander. The cantata is really a sort of one-act operetta, a jocose production representing the efforts of a stern parent to check his daughter's propensities in coffee drinking, the new fashioned habit. One seldom thinks of Bach as a humorist, but the music here is written in a mock heroic vein. Recitatives and arias having a merry flavor, hinting at what the master might have done in light opera. The libretto shows the father Schlandrian, or Slowpoke, trying by various threats to dissuade his daughter from further indulgence in the new vice, and in the end succeeding by threatening to deprive her of a husband. But his victory is only temporary. When the mother and the grandmother indulge in coffee, asks the final trio, who can blame the daughter? Bach uses the spelling coffee, not café. The cantata was sung as recently as December 18, 1921, at a concert in New York by the Society of the Friends of Music, directed by Arthur Bedansky. Lyschen, or Betty the Daughter, has a delightful aria beginning, Ah, how sweet coffee tastes, lovelier than a thousand kisses, sweeter far than muscatel wine the opening bars of which are reproduced on page 598. As the text is not long, it is printed here in its entirety. Characters Messenger and Narrator, Tenor, Slowpoke, Bass, Betty, Daughter to Slowpoke, Soprano. Tenor, Recitative, Be silent, do not talk, but notice what will happen. Here comes old Slowpoke with his daughter Betty. He's grumbling like a common bear. Just listen to what he says. Enter Slowpoke muttering. What vexatious things one's children are. A hundred thousand naughty ways. What I tell my daughter Betty might as well be told to the moon. Enter Betty. Slowpoke, recitative. You naughty child, you mischievous girl. Oh, what can I have my way? Give up your coffee. Betty, dear father, do not be so strict. If I can't have my little demi toss of coffee three times a day, I'm just like a dried up piece of roast goat. Betty, Aria, ah, how sweet coffee tastes, lovelier than a thousand kisses, sweeter far than muscatel wine. I must have my coffee, and if anyone wishes to please me, let him present me with coffee. Slowpoke, recitative. If you won't give up coffee, young lady, I won't let you go to any wedding feasts. I won't even let you go walking. Betty, oh yes, do let me have my coffee. Slowpoke, what a little monkey you are anyway. I will not let you have any whalebone skirts of the present fashionable size. Betty, oh, I can easily fix that. Slowpoke, but I won't let you stand at the window and watch the new styles. Betty, that doesn't bother me either, but be good and let me have my coffee. Slowpoke, but from my hands you'll get no silver or gold ribbon for your hair. Betty, oh well, so long as I have what does satisfy me. Slowpoke, you wretched Betty, you, you won't give in to me? Slowpoke, air, oh these girls, what obstinate dispositions they do have. They certainly are not easy to manage, but if one hits the right spot, oh well, one may succeed. Slowpoke, with an air of being sure of success this time. Recitative. Now please do what father says. Betty. In everything except about coffee. Slowpoke. Well, then you must make up your mind to do without a husband. Betty. Oh, yes? Father? A husband? Slowpoke. I swear you can't have him. Betty. Till I give up coffee? Oh, well. Coffee? Let it be forgotten, dear father. I will not drink none slowpoke then you can have one betty aria today dear father do it today he goes out ah a husband really this suits me exactly when they know i must have coffee why before i go to bed tonight i can have a valiant lover goes out tenor recitative now go hunt up old slowpoke and just watch him get a husband for his daughter for Betty is secretly making it known that no wooer may come to the house unless he promises me himself and has it put in the marriage contract that he will allow me to make coffee 
whenever I will. Enter Slowpoke and Betty, singing, as chorus with tenor. Trio. The cat will not give up the mouse. Old maids continue coffee sisters. The mother loves her drink of coffee. Grandma, too, is a coffee fiend. Who now will blame the daughter? Research has discovered only one piece of sculpture associated with coffee, the statue of the Austrian hero Kolschitsky, the patron saint of the Vienna coffee houses. It graces the second floor corner of a house in the Favoriten Strasse, where it was erected in his honor by the Coffee Makers Guild of Vienna. The great brother heart is shown in the attitude of pouring coffee into cups on a tray from an oriental service pot. The celebrated Café Pedrocchi, the center of life in the city of Padua, Italy, in the early part of the 19th century, is one of the most beautiful buildings erected in Italy. Its use is apparent at first glance. It was begun in 1816, opened June 9, 1831, and completed in 1842. Antonio Pedrocchi, 1776 to 1852, an obscure Paduan coffee house keeper, tormented by a desire for glory, conceived the idea of building the most beautiful coffee house in the world and carried it out. End of section 59.